Okay, guys, well, we are talking about how to um, continue on to allow the blessing uh, that's on us and inside of us to manifest so that we can fulfill the covenant, uh, the new covenant. And uh, you understand that uh, in the old covenant, uh, Abraham uh, in Genesis chapter 12 was blessed by the father and said that he was going to be not only blessed, but he would bless, be blessed to be a blessing. And we see the manifestation, the ultimate manifestation that when Jesus came and was manifest in the flesh as a Jewish person and then was crucified for the Jewish race, uh, which consummated that covenant, that old covenant, and then brought in a new covenant. Uh, and this new covenant, of course, was different. Let's go over to um, Hebrews chapter 10. And we're going to have a look at a little bit of a, a difference here between those two covenants. And, and uh, we need to understand these covenants because it affects the way we think. Now, uh, just a little while ago, we were talking about how in Acts, uh, Paul and uh, Barnabas, I think it was, at that stage, uh, were having a confrontation with Jewish people who believe that Christians, the anointed uh, believers, should go under the law and they should be circumcised before they could be saved. And of course, Paul was a great exponent of the grace message and he'd received a personal revelation we find in, in Galatians, uh, I think it's around chapter 2, that he had personal revelation, or it might have been chapter 1, he had personal revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ that no other person had received. And he was, the, the, uh, Jesus explained the gospel to him. Now, uh, if we have a look in the first four uh, books of the Bible, uh, we see Jesus under the light of sense knowledge, really. It was Jesus as he was born and then grew up and then he went into his ministry at 30, was baptized in the spirit and, and proceeded to do a whole lot of miracles as a Jewish rabbi. And then at the uh, end of three years, we find that he's then put on trial and crucified by the Jewish race. And also it says uh, the Gentiles, when we find that both the Jews and the Gentiles uh, were part and parcel of this crucifixion. And after he'd been crucified, he, he died physically first. Uh, actually, sorry, I'll correct that. He died spiritually, uh, which then, uh, and we find him calling out, my father, my father, why have you forsaken me? Well, what, what's happened is that Jesus now has gone under spiritual death, under the power of spiritual death, which he never had been under. He said, I give my life, uh, no one takes it from me. So we find that Jesus voluntarily put himself under the enemy, under spiritual death, under the dominion of death, and that's how they were able to crucify him. Uh, and then he died, uh, died physically after that. And we find him going down into the pains of death. Now, some people say, oh, well, Jesus just went down to, to Sheol on the good side. But on the good side, we find that Abraham was comforted. Uh, but Jesus went into the pains of death. So we understand that Jesus actually went to hell and paid a price in his spirit for your sins and for my sins and for all of humanity, both Jews and Gentiles at that stage. And then came back up having paid the price, came up having paid the price for all of redemption. That means everything that Adam had transgressed and everything that Adam had done, Jesus had remedied at that stage. And so when he came up, this is going to sound a bit funny for some of you, but what happened was that you came up identified with Jesus as, a, as the human race. What happened was when he was resurrected, you were resurrected. If you've asked him to be Lord of your life, you were born again in the spirit with Jesus Christ. And so it's really as if you defeated Satan, that you were born out of death. And it says that he's the firstborn of many brethren. And so what happened was that in Christ, you were, first of all, you died, you were buried, and then you were resurrected. 
So that old man, it says in Romans, we go through Romans, that old man was crucified with Christ. So you were crucified with Christ. Then what happened was that you were buried and then you were resurrected. So you have become a new creation in Christ Jesus. So you're newly created. So when we, we talk about this new creation, it's really the nature of the Father that's come on the inside of you. So you have the nature of the Father, which is amazing that God would put his nature. That's why you can be called a son of God. Not the son of God, but a joint son of God with Jesus. So God counts you equally. This gets people in, it gets me, it gets lots of preachers, and well, word of faith preachers anyway, in trouble. When we say well, you are no more unworthy than Jesus to stand in front of the Father. Why? Because such was the price that Jesus paid that he brought you out of that condemnation. Now, we've been talking about that. People aren't condemned for what they do. They're condemned for who they are. See, they were born condemned. It wasn't your fault that you were condemned. You were born from a race that was condemned. And then what happened was that Jesus paid the price and you were born out of condemnation. That's amazing. You see, you didn't work your way out of condemnation. You were born out of condemnation. So that means that you no longer have sin inside of you. Now, <laughs> Jesus, a lot of, a lot of uh, you know, uh, they're carnal doctrines. I believe they're carnal doctrines and doctrines of demons. Um, Paul says to Timothy, watch out, because there's, there are doctrines that come from demons. And one of these doctrines, I believe, that's got into the church is that Jesus was a flock. His redemption was a flop because he only partially, uh, you know, really he's redeemed you, but death's the only way that you can ever, ever get rid of sin. Well, I believe that's a doctrine of a demon. So my righteousness, the righteousness of my spirit, what it does is it, it, can't, it be, begins to dominate my soul and then my soul dominates my flesh. Now, I am going to die physically, but I have died and was resurrected spiritually. So uh, Jesus, it says in Ephesians, I think, uh, Jesus gave us the guarantee of the spirit or the guarantee of our inheritance, our, redempt, uh, uh, the bo our body redeemed. So what's going to happen is that your body, whilst your spirit is, has been instantly recreated, your soul is being saved in the sense that it's getting renewed to what your spirit is. But your body needs to be subjected because it hasn't been, if you like, fully redeemed. Although we have the power of redemption outworking in our mortal bodies. It says that in Romans. It says that, um, that your body has been, uh, is, is being healed by um, your mortal body, which is your flesh-doomed body, is being redeemed or has the redemption quality in that you can be healed. So your body can be healed. Now, a lot of people don't know that if Jesus was going around and bearing people's sins, and it says that in Matthew, it says that he bore our sicknesses and carried our diseases, then, and he required faith for people to be healed, we must understand that, that sickness isn't just something that's in your flesh. Sickness is something that's manifesting in your flesh, but it's a, it's a reflection of a spiritual problem. You see, in Christ Jesus, you are healed. Now, a lot of Christians don't experience that because their mind hasn't been renewed to that. And so they're still going around without their redemption, with, without, the, sorry, without the inheritance of their redemption. They are redeemed, but their minds must be renewed to their redemption. And so many times what Christians want to do is they want to get rid of symptoms in their body, but they don't want to get rid of the cause of the sickness. And so many times what they're doing is they, they, they might go to a pastor and ask for, for uh, prayer, or they might go to a doctor. There's nothing wrong with that. Go to a doctor and ask him for help. But if you haven't dealt with the spiritual problem, that's on the inside, uh, then what's going to happen is the symptoms are obviously going to come back. So we need to do, deal with the root of the problem. 
Now, uh, tonight I wanted to talk about one of the blessing blockers uh, that comes into the Christian's life, and, and that's the spirit of strife. Now, strife has its origin in the enemy. Uh, we find that back in Isaiah 14, uh, Satan is exalting, and there's a picture of it, and Satan's trying to exalt himself and take away the authority or the, the throne of God. He says, I will, well, why don't we go up there first? Let's have a look at Hebrews 10 first, because I'm jumping around a little bit. But uh, let's have a look. Hebrews chapter 10. And we're talking about a covenant. It says here, the new covenant in verse 9. Uh, verse 8 says, Previously when he said, You don't desire sacrifices and offerings, you have no pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, which are offered according to the law. Now this is talking about the inadequacy of the law to be able to deal with sin. All right, So, so we understand that God didn't have any pleasure because it didn't deal with the actual problem. It's like when you don't deal with the actual problem of sickness. Uh, many Christians are in strife uh, and they're bringing in or allowing infirmities. They're allowing Satan to come in and take away their redemption because they won't submit to the love law and the protection of that love law. And so what they do is they walk outside of the protection of the blood of Christ in the sense that they walk into the enemy's territory when they get in strife. And so they allow sicknesses to attack them and allow demons to attack them. Uh, we'll talk about that in a sec. But, but here the Lord's saying, I have no pleasure in the first covenant because it doesn't deal with the issue. All it did was cover like a, a promissory note uh, for something that was coming. It just covered the Jewish nation. It never dealt. And so the Jews, of course, were only servants of Jehovah. They were never sons because their natures weren't changed. But you as Christians have a change of nature. You have this love nature on the inside. And that is what we need to submit to. You see, uh, um, children don't like to submit to love. Why? Because when we submit to love, we have to give away our life. We have to give our life to others. The, the, the nature, and, and we'll look at this in a second, but the nature of love is that it gives. It's a continual, our covenant of love is a giving covenant. It's not, it's not going and getting from people, it's actually giving. And for most of my younger life, I was looking for people who could build me. You know, I was actually listening to a, a person who, who's... Um, He's involved with uh, worship and technology and worship and that kind of stuff. And every year he would go to a really large um, convention over in America. Uh, I think they call it the NAM convention. I don't know. Um, I've, I've actually seen videos, but I don't know why they call it NAM. It must be national or something to do with music or something. Anyway, but he was talking about the difference uh, between... He was talking about networking. We all, <laughs> we all understand networking. Uh, but he, he says, uh, you know, I'm, what I want to teach you about networking is don't be that guy. Well, I, I didn't know what he was talking about when he said that guy. But then I realised what he was talking about. He's the guy that's going around looking for people in the network in the, you know, or people that can build, build him. So if he doesn't think that you're worth it, he doesn't want to network with you. He doesn't want to talk to you. So he's, he's scanning and he's looking at your name badge to see whether or not you can help him, whether you can build him. And he talks about uh, his, one of his visits to, uh, to this place. Now, Sweetwater is a... I've seen Sweetwater advertised on YouTube. It seems to be a very large... I don't know whether it's a company or whatever, but it's to do with music. And he said, oh, we did some actual... We, we did some uh, work for Sweetwater... Uh, regarding music technology and uh, he must have been going around and had a Sweetwater badge on his, with his name on it there and he said as soon as they saw uh, the you know they look at your name not interested oh, and then they see Sweetwater and suddenly there's this there's this amazing interest in you as a person like how can I serve you how can I look after you why not because not because of you because of what they thought they could receive 
Now, as, as a young Christian, that's exact. I was going from church to church, which is horrific. I was, a, 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 you know, I was studying. I was a student, uh, you know, and I'd go from person to person to see how they could help me with my studies. Uh, it'd be really good if I could get a person that would actually complete an assignment for me. I, I, I thought, you know, I've, I've really won, <laughs> and this must be the Lord uh, <laughs> bringing them in. Only problem was, of course, I immediately went under them and and became their slave. Uh, that you know. The, the Christian church doesn't tell you about that. When you, become, you have someone as a source, you become their slave because the borrower is the servant of the lender. Ah, never knew that. Uh, but in my younger life, that's what I was doing. I was actually going around and sucking off people and really not fulfilling the covenant of love at all. And so, of course, I was a carnal Christian uh, carnal Christians are always miserable because they know enough to know that it's wrong to sin, but they keep sinning. So it's a miserable, absolutely miserable life uh, because you're always under condemnation, you know, uh, and knowing that you're doing the wrong thing as you do the wrong thing. Uh, so it's, it's, really, it's really quite miserable because you've, you've decided that you know more than God. And you don't want to submit to his, his, his love rule. And so you go out and you act in selfishness. Of course, you put yourself under the enemy when you do that. Um, okay, so God is, is disappointed with this first covenant because it doesn't really qualify uh, or doesn't make children. So what the father's after, of course, is not slaves or, or servants. He's after He's after children. What do we know about children? Well, <laughs> we might know a few things about children. <laughs> children, of, uh, 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 you have a different relationship when you're a child. I know that uh, all of my children, when they walk into this house, they have the right to go straight to my fridge. Uh, here's the thing, they don't ask, they just walk in and they take. <laughs> and why is that? Well, that's because they're my kids and they have certain rights. Now, if someone else came in here, uh, and actually I remember when I was younger, uh, I had a guest I didn't know uh, and some, one, one of my friends had brought him along with him and I remember we had, and you would think this is a little bit petty of me and, and obviously it was, um, we had a fruit bowl and uh, this guy just came in and didn't know him from, but I said, just took an orange from the fruit bowl without asking and I thought oh you know obviously you have a fruit bowl there because you know you want to look at it you don't want to eat it <laughs> but I was offended at this particular person why well because he'd come into my home and he had violated something that which is in my which uh, my mind which is called as far as I was concerned manners in that you would ask if you could have something but uh, such was the entitlement of this person. He felt that he could just go and now look. Who knows? He may have been, uh, may have grown up in a in a house where that was that was what you do. I don't know. But my point is, there's a difference between children and servants. The servant or a hired hand wouldn't come in and make themselves at home. A child, however, will come into a place and they will rule the roost. Uh, because they've got a different relationship. And that's what the father's saying here, is that he wants a different relationship with you than being a servant. He doesn't want you to be a servant. He wants you to be a son. However, if you're not renewed in your mind, you might, and you have an old covenant mentality, which we said last week is preached on every corner just about. We said Moses was preached on every corner. That's what the early disciples had, uh, had said. There is law being preached everywhere. And so having the new covenant preached uh, is, is not common. And so we have to fight for this new covenant uh, message. We have to fight to protect it. That's what Paul said to the Galatians. You think that uh, now that you're, you're so sophisticated, you've grown in the Lord, you're going back to the law and you're going to experience the same miracles that you did when you believed? Not going to happen, guys. Not going to happen because you, you're going back to being servants 
instead of sons. And there's a particular doctrinal belief that goes with being a son. And this is exactly what Paul's talking about here in Hebrews. Um, talking about Jesus, um, well, actually, let's go on verse 11 of Hebrews 10. But every priest stands daily ministering repetitively, offering the same sacrifices, now listen to this, which can never take away sin. What do we find about the Old Testament? There it is. There's your definition of the Old Covenant. It could never take away sin. Well, if we just go on the antithesis of that, the antithesis, what, what would we expect the New Covenant one to do? If the Old One couldn't take away sin, what would you expect the New One to be able to do, which is a better covenant? You would expect that it would take away sin. And then Paul goes on and says, but this man, talking about Jesus, after he had offered how many sacrifices? One sacrifice for sins forever. One sacrifice for sins forever at one time. Such was the blood of Jesus that he only needed one sacrifice. He only needed to die once. But every year, Animals were sacrificed repeatedly, repetitively, to try and cover sin. But Jesus, at one time, dealt with sin and put it away. Now, the, I talked about doctrines of demons. What uh, This doctrine of demon that says that you're still a sinner saved by grace, what they're saying is that the blood of Jesus is only as good as the blood of goats, uh, you know, of, of bulls and goats. Essentially, it's saying it re Jesus' blood really didn't deal with sin. It did a bit. And then, you know, what has to happen is there's this gradual sanctification. Well, that's not true. You're sanctified by faith. You're saved by faith. You see, you're not saved. Um, you're not saved, you know, gradually. You're saved at one time. When you died with Christ, you were saved. You were buried with him and you were raised with him. Praise God. So what have we discovered? Well, this new covenant uh, has been instituted by Jesus and that you are no longer a sinner and saved by grace. You were a sinner and then you got saved by grace. So this is the state that you're in. God's not out condemning you. He's not looking for your faults. He's actually empowering you. And that's what we're saying, that this message that I'm preaching, this new covenant message, empowers the blessing in you. It empowers you to go and succeed. When you start to change your mind about who you are and that you're not just someone that's a failure and you realise that Jesus has taken your failures uh, inside of himself, he took, well, sin is really a failing. It's failing to make a mark, generally. So it's really, I remember this from my dad, he was very good at illustration, he was talking about sin and he said, well, you know, sin came from this idea that you'd have an arrow, you take the arrow out and you fire the arrow, that's not a really great bow, is it? Didn't look like a, a very, <laughs> I looked like one of those little babies, didn't I? Kind of on the, on the uh, <laughs> you know, I should have done a Robin Hood, shouldn't I? Um, but uh, what would happen is that the arrow would fly towards the target. If it fell short, then it sinned, you see. And that's really what sin is. It's you falling short. And you probably all have heard of that, uh, that uh, context of everyone for all of sin, and you should be able to finish that if you grew up in any kind of a Baptist church, you would know that for all of sin and fallen short, of the glory of God. And essentially, that's what sin is. But that is what Jesus came to fix. You falling short. He came to do that and he did it once. You see, Jesus died once. He, he's not repeated, repeatedly going as an, a high priest. He's already done the work. He's cleansed you and gotten rid of sin in your life. So you're no longer a sinner. You're free from sin. Now, in in Romans, Paul's making this big argument in Romans that you're no longer a sinner. And then in Romans chapter 7, which um, is used incorrectly, this is a person under the law. Not, and 
this is where Paul says, oh, the, the things I want to do, I can't do. Uh, um, and the things I don't want to do, I end up doing. You see, well, that's not the Christian's life. That might be a carnal Christian's life. But that's not the Christian's life. The Christian's life is full of success. It's full of overcoming. And what we find is that Paul is talking to people who are under the law, who, haven't, who aren't able to fulfill the Christian life because they haven't got the life nature of Jesus on the inside. You have the life nature of Jesus on the inside. That's why you, this blessing is on you. Now, we were talking before, there, there's a particular killer of the blessing, and we, we want to talk about that. We talked about Satan originating this thing called strife. Now, strife is, is a... Uh, how are we going to express this? Strive is, it's really the antithesis to love. Love, we said, was us giving us ourselves. And remember, I talked about me when I was younger. I wasn't out to give you anything. I was out to get something from you because I was going to exalt myself to where I knew I should be. You see, I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth, but I knew I should have been, you see. <laughs> and so... Knowing with that knowledge inside me, I was about to go and get your silver spoon. You see, that's what strife's about. And if we go back to Isaiah 14, we're going to find the origins of strife. Isaiah 14. So let's go back there. And what we want to see is how many eyes are in this context or in this, sorry, in this uh, chapter. In verse 12 of 14, we have a picture of Satan uh, in, in heaven called, and he's called Lucifer, or the word interpreted, the name interpreted would be light bearer. So we understand he has got amazing wisdom. He is full of wisdom. He's full of, and God has created him the covering cherub. So he has got... The most, one of the most important jobs in heaven. Uh, so he, he, he's been created to be this particular person. So let's have a look in verse 12. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, you who weaken nations? For, now listen, to this, is, this is the origin of strife. This is the blessing killer. Do you know that Lucifer had the top job? But he lost it. He lost it. And do you know why he lost it? For this very reason. And as Christians, we've got to be very careful because this blessing is taking you to the top. But this strife stuff is a blessing killer. And the, if you remain in the covenant law, which is the love law, you will go to the top. You can't help it. It's like a cork at the bottom of the ocean. You know where it's going. If it's unhindered, it's going to the top. That is the Christian life. If you'll leave it alone. Why? Because you have the nature of the Father on the inside of you. He is wanting you to rule. He's wanting you to take back his kingdom, but not the way that Satan wants to take kingdom, uh, you know, take God's kingdom. Let's have a look. We'll keep reading. It says, um, For you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne. Who's this guy on about? He's on about himself. That's exactly how my young life was. It was all about me exalting me. And I would use people to do it. You know, much to my shame. And I am ashamed of that now. I look back and I think, my goodness. How could I have called myself a believer? When I'm using people as sources rather than believing God, I'm, belie I'm believing that you're going to somehow, whatever I can suck off you, I can use to exalt myself. This is exactly uh, the nature of Satan. I will ascend to, into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Now, the stars, of course, are angels. So he's going to go... <laughs> Ever had any brothers and sisters? 
Are they angels? <laughs> um, one of the key characteristics of families is that this, this you've probably heard, I don't know whether you've heard it, called sibling rivalry. That should never be. It was never meant to be. But sibling rivalry is one of the key killers of families. Sibling rivalry, that's where each child is exalting themselves and wanting first place. So this is exactly what Satan was doing. He's trying to exalt himself above all the stars of God. Well, <laughs> this one, no, it doesn't matter. This is a problem. This is a problem. You don't want to exalt yourself. See, God wants to exalt you. He just doesn't want you to exalt you. God is looking to promote you. He came along to Abraham. He said, this is the blessing. I will exalt you. I will make you the head and not the tail. I want you to be this. So God's wanting this, but here's Satan taking God's job. And as Christians, we've got to be careful. We don't take God's job. It's not our job to, to fight and fuss and strive and get above everyone else. Now, I have been and have been a, a member of churches and I have, and you would understand that some of my brothers and myself included here uh, were striving to get to the top. Well, what kind of church is that? That is not that's a baby church. And Paul's dealing with that with the Corinthians. He said, I want to come and teach you some revelation, but because of the, the mentality you have, I can't, I can't get past baby food. Every week, I've got to come along and give you, pardon me, I've got to come along and give you milk. Why? Because there's strife in the midst of you. Each of you are looking to exalt yourselves instead of exalting your brother. Now, the law, the, the, the principle of life is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Now, here's the problem. <laughs> if you are thinking you're going to use people to get somewhere, guess what you're going to reap? You're going to reap people using you. I, 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 sometimes I don't giggle, but sometimes people come up and they tell me about how they've been used. <laughs> and I... I have to hide myself from smiling because these people are the biggest users I've ever, <laughs> I've ever met. And they're surprised this person absolutely used me up. What a surprise. <laughs> have you been using anyone? Oh, well, that, you know, that doesn't... I'm under grace. <laughs> Forget about that. Um, but they've hurt me, you know. And they come up and they say, well, they've hurt me. Well, here's the thing. Are you hurting anyone else? Are you, you know... Oh, no one loves me. No one cares. About me. Well, are you caring about someone else? You, you, you know, it's it doesn't take a great deal of discernment to realise that there's, you know, there may be some problems in that particular person themselves. Moving right along, so uh, here we have Lucifer. He's going to exalt himself above his brothers, above his brethren. And then he says something else. He says, and I will sit on the mount of the congregation in the recesses of the north. So we understand that heaven's got a north because we're talking about heaven here. So if it's got a north, <laughs> it's got to be a planet. So we're talking about not nebulous here. This is not, you know, this is an actual place. This is where God resides. This is God's home. And here's the thing. Luce is moving in. <laughs> ha! It's like, you know, don't let the devil have a ride in your car because pretty soon you know what he's going to be wanting to do. He's going to be wanting to drive your car. <laughs> so be careful about who you let move into your house. <laughs> and that's the truth. You've got to watch that very carefully. Sometimes. The Lord will give you wisdom. And he says this, And I'll sit on the mountain of the congregation. In the recess of the north, and here it is, I will, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will be like the Most High. Lucifer understands he needs to have the top job. <laughs> Why? Well, he's decided on that good. <laughs> this is the problem with people who are a little carnal. Their judgments are pretty pathetic. <laughs> They're judging themselves by themselves 
You see, and this, this is why God has got the place of exalting you. He says the promotion doesn't come from the east or the west. Promotion comes from the Lord. You see, if you do the right things and you haven't got people as a source and you're walking by faith, what will happen is that you will be exalted because God's looking at you and he's examining what you're doing. He's examining your heart. And, uh, you know, just looking back at, 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 at Saul and David, we understand that, that Saul was disqualified from ruling because he got to a place where he thought that he was it in a bit. You see, it, it, it's a tragedy because at the start of his kingship, when they were looking to make him king, he was extremely humble. He was hiding. He was hiding out with, 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 behind some asses or something so that they couldn't find him. And then what happened was that he got in a position of rulership and he's like Satan. He started to think that he's eaten a bit. He's really started to separate himself from God with pride. And this is, this is what happens. The pride, the origin of pride comes from someone thinking that they should be somewhere else other than where they are. <laughs> You see, I, I really should have your job, you know? <laughs> it's a hey, that's all right. Hey, and, uh, no, I've, heard, I've heard people say that before <laughs> until, until I came to take their job. <laughs> what? Uh, you know, it's about the, the same guy that had the pig, you know? Uh, you, you've heard of that, the, the, the two best friends are out fishing. <laughs> we don't want to digress. But uh, they're, going through, they're going through the conversation just to help those people on tape. Uh, you know, we're best friends, aren't we? Of course we're best friends. We're fishing buddies. He said, oh, look, if, if, if you had this, I know, you, you know, if you had this bike, I know you'd give me it. Of course I would. And they go through this whole list of, of amazing things that they give each other. And then one of the guys says, and we're best buddies, and, 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 and because we're best buddies, if you had a pig, you'd give me a pig, wouldn't you? He says, that's so unfair, you know I've got a pig. <laughs> and we love that story because we can all relate to that. <laughs> Here's the thing. We don't know what we want until we, you know, we've got to give it away. Let's not digress, though. So Satan here is exalting himself. And uh, he's decided that he wants the top job. And he has decided that himself. He believes, and this is a tragedy, he believes he's qualified. He believes that he, this is a created being, has decided that he should take the creator's place. Now, that's a problem, guys. You might think, oh, well, that's just dreadful. How could this created being think <laughs> Now, we go over to Romans chapter 1, which we will in a sec. We'll see that there are some other people who have got this same problem. But look at what happens when he makes this tragic decision. He says, I will ascend above the heights of cloud. I'll be like, yet you shall be brought down to hell and to the sides of the pit. That was his last mistake <laughs> in heaven. Because he got kicked out. He lost his job, guys. Now, I've been in a position where I've lost my job. And I trace it back. Sometimes people, people have stolen my job or I've been persecuted out of jobs. But many times what happens is that, that we get to a point where we get entitled. We think this, this is owed to us. You better be careful when you get to that stage. You better be careful because... God gives things to us and he gives unreservedly. He's wonderful. He's the most generous guy. But what he said, there's a scripture in James that says God resists the proud. He resists the proud, but he gives favor to the humble. So there's a danger, guys, when we move from being humble, and this is what we're talking about with Saul. Saul got to a stage where he moved from humility. He was surrounded by things, stuff and that. And this stuff and that started to change his perspective on himself. 
And we've got to be very careful as Christians because what's going to happen is that you're going to get exalted. But you've got to be careful. It says in Deuteronomy chapter, let's go there. <laughs> I think it's really important. 8, Deuteronomy 8, 18. It says, you will remember the Lord your God for he gives you the ability to get wealth. So that he might establish his covenant. So there's a reason why God's making you wealthy. There's a reason for this blessing on you. Now, God wants you to be blessed because you're his kid. But he doesn't want you to get a, an inflated sense of your own worth over what he gives you. And this is what happens to people. This is what happened to Lucifer. Lucifer, if we went over to Ezekiel 38, it talks about he, all the tablets and all the jewelry that God put on him. God was, God, God was just lavishing it on him. And, and, and he started to get the idea that he was important. This is what happens. This is a tragedy that happens to Christians. They get into the covenant. They start to get blessed. And then they start to forget where the blessing came from. The blessing comes from God. The blessing comes from the word. It's not you. It's not your righteousness. not your smarts. It's the favour that God puts on your life that gets you there. And then what, what happens is that people forget about the Father. They forget about their relationship. Actually, it says in, in the New Testament, it says that, the, that people get fat. We're not talking physically here, fat spiritually. That means that they've got more than they can handle, more than enough. And what happens is that they begin to just get lazy. But, you know, I'll, <laughs> I better be careful here. Now, um, uh, one of my wonderful uh, teachers in the Word said, you know, these are, these are people who order tapes. And when they get the tapes, they never listen to them anymore. They've just ordered tapes um, <laughs> for the sake of it. But they never listen. Whereas when they first started... They couldn't even afford tapes. They had to take a loan out to go and get tapes so they could listen to it so they'd get enough word to, to eventually pay cash for tapes. Now they're so abundantly blessed. There's so much word in their life. They just don't care. Oh, yeah, I just, you know. And they've got this lethargic attitude towards the Father. Well, what's happened? Well, their, their mentality shifted from one of I'm going to be the blessing. I'm going, I'm, I'm going to be God's right-hand man to, oh, well, you know, it doesn't really matter. And I'm fairly comfortable. So what happens is we, we move to that comfort zone, you know, because at the start we were so desperate we couldn't even eat. Now we're starting, now we've got, you know, we've moved from, from being, you know, in rentals and now we own our own home. Now we just don't have to worry anymore. Because everything that we were worried about has, has turned around. So God has prospered us to a point where we're really self-sufficient. We're not really. Because we go over to Revelation, it talks about a church that thought it was self-sufficient. And, and Jesus says, you've got all the, you say you've got all this gold, but I see you as poor. You've, you, you're dressed in all these wonderful clothes, but he says, I see you as naked. And so the Lord's perception and their perception were completely different. So he's talking about a church here. So as a church, we've got to be careful that we don't get this idea and get this, this idea of comforting ourselves on, on stuff that we've got. What we want to do, and we're talking about the other, the other morning, was we want to have an apostolic mentality. That means a, a, a mentality that we're going out and, and we're linked with Jesus and we've got compassion for people who aren't coping. People who used to be like us, who've never heard the word. And we want to be able to share that word with them. Look, we've got to finish there, guys, but um, I'm going to ask if you've got, uh, if you've got a testimony, uh, I'm going to ask you to... Uh, to actually, I think I've realised I've just got a microphone on. This is not going to work. So we're going to finish here. Uh, and next week I'll tell you about the great testimony. How's that? Uh, so we'll finish there, guys. And we're going to have a little bit of uh, time where we're going to share and uh, fellowship uh, over a cup of tea. So thanks very much for tuning in, guys. And we'll see you next time.